Dr. Jim Brooks um, received his medical degree here at Stanford and then subsequent training at Johns Hopkins. Came back and joined the faculty in 1997. He's the Keith and Jan Hurlbut Professor of Urology. His clinical practice through his whole career has been focused on prostate cancer, and in recent years, he's really been honing in on uh, the whole area of active surveillance for early prostate cancer where we may not treat a patient right away, and Jim is one of the world's experts in that area. He's had an established basic science laboratory for his whole career as well, and in that he really is looking at trying to discover the, the two, what we call a biomarker, some um, chemical or protein or something in the prostate that can give us a clue of what the cancer is going to, how the cancer is going to behave and what, how it's going to respond to treatment. In addition to all that, he's had multiple leadership roles here at the school and is currently the vice chair of our department and chief of our oncology program. He recently also developed an interest in benign prostate enlargement, which actually is a, a very common condition and not very well understood. And he received a prestigious O'Brien Center grant to study that area, trying to apply some of the techniques that we've learned in prostate cancer towards that benign disease. So Dr. Brooks, I will let you tell us about your research. My pleasure. Thank you, Isla. <clears throat> Um, I felt a little sheepish when I came up with this title, because in medical circles anyway, it's sort of become a cliche to talk about bedside to bench and back and things like that. But I picked it because it literally describes how we do research and how my lab has done research for now 30 years. Um, basically, we surgeons cut things out of people. So we take tumors out, deliver those to the laboratory where we, where we investigate, try and make discoveries, many times using state-of-the-art technology not available elsewhere. And then from what we learn from that technology, bring it back, try and bring it back into the clinic. And that's the hard part. Uh, so what I want to do today is give you two, just two examples of this. There's many examples, but I want to give you two examples of projects that we've done uh, where we've applied this paradigm to try and understand prostate cancer. The first is uh, the use of genomics to understand these prostate tumors. Um, this character over here is, is a guy I worked with, a biochemist named Pat Brown that I met not long after I came here, uh, who had invented a technology called DNA microarrays. Now, in the 1990s, when I started doing research, if we were interested in, in genes in cancer, we'd look at one gene at a time and try to figure out what it did in the cancer. With Pat's technology, this is a printer that would make the microarrays, this is a microarray, we could look at all genes simultaneously. Now, when he invented that technology, we, he also had to invent a whole new way of doing statistics to try, try and understand, these, st understand the data and so on. So it, was, it really was paradigm shifting. It really blew the field open. Um, so Pat is a disruptor. And uh, he retired a little early from Stanford to go disrupt the field of food. He founded Impossible Foods and invented the Impossible Burger. So Pat's an incredible guy. Um, so this is the type of data, this is a slice of the type of data that we would get from these microarrays. And think of this as like an Excel spreadsheet where um, each column represents a sample. The pink ones here are normal prostate. The colored ones are different cancer type. And each uh, row here represents a different gene. And rather than having a bunch of numbers in the Excel spreadsheet, we paint the cells with color. So red means a gene is cranked up. Uh, green mean it's, means it's turned down. And we use a variety of statistical approaches to pull out genes that we think are correlated with more aggressive cancer or less aggressive cancer. Then we test them on tissue microarrays. And we have a little display what tissue microarrays are back there, where we can look across a whole bunch of samples and find out if that gene connotes good or bad cancer. So we've been doing this iteratively for many years now and identified a set of bad genes. Uh, that connote aggressive prostate cancer. And, um, and we've uh, published these and put them out to, in the world for use. Now, scientists get excited with lists of genes like this and, or identifying genes like this because they want to understand how these genes work to drive cancers and make them behave aggressively. I'm a clinician. So for me, I, wanna, I have clinical questions. Let me give you an example. With PSA testing, we diagnose 300,000 cases of prostate cancer every year in this country. 
30,000 men die of it. So there's a big discrepancy between the number we diagnose and the number destined to die of prostate cancer. Why is that? Well, the reason for that, we've known since the 1940s that um, uh, there are a lot of guys walking around with prostate cancer. If you do autopsies on men who die of other causes, heart attack, stroke, car accident, and have a card-carrying pathologist slice that prostate up thinly and look in it, these are the numbers here. For men in their 60s, uh, in their 60s about two-thirds of them have cells in their prostate that are prostate cancer cells, two-thirds. Three percent of men die of prostate cancer. So what that means is there's a lot of prostate cancer out there to be found if you start PSA, doing PSA testing and biopsying people. So what do we do with that? Well, I just sat in clinic yesterday and talked to guys who had what looked like low-risk prostate cancer, but I don't know. I don't know. I can't, I'm trying to figure out which one's the tiger and which one's the pussycat, right? So that's what these genes can be useful for. And some of the genes that we have found uh, now are in clinical tests. So these are three different clinical tests that are out there that, are, that can be done on a biopsy to genetically profile them and tell you whether or not the cancer is aggressive. And there are a bunch of genes we discovered in those tests. We didn't patent any of them. Like I said, we just dumped it out there. And it's thrilling to see that they're used. Um, the other thing we've done is now that these tests, we're, we're developing these tests and have these tests, we've put together a large a group of patients that look for all the world like they have autopsy cancers, but we're not sure. About 40% of them will become more aggressive in five years. And so now we have about 2,100 patients enrolled across the country that we collect blood, urine, biopsy samples. We now have hundreds of thousands of samples that we can use to test these markers to see if they actually work to predict. So this is project one. Second project I want to talk about is one that's just a few years old, and I'm really excited about it. Um, um, this is a cell. This is over on the side here. This is an electron microscope view of a cell. This is the cell membrane down here, and this kind of lawn on top of it, this grass on top of it, is actually strings of sugar. Cells are literally sugar-coated. Um, and the sugars are attached to proteins, hence the name glycoproteins. And it turns out that these sugars vary between non-cancerous and cancerous tissue. They differ. And recently, there's new technologies to look at that. I work with a chemist, Carolyn Bertozzi, and a protein biochemist, Sharon Pateri, to do that. This is an example from prostate cancer. So prostatic acid phosphatase was the old-fashioned PSA. And you can measure it in the bloodstream. On the bottom here, one of these spots on prostatic acid phosphatase, these are, these are how a chemist draws sugars, these long chains here. There's only two of them. In cancer, there are seven different types of sugars at this spot. Imagine if a patient comes in, has an elevated PSA, and now I measure this and say, whoops, there's all these new sugars on here that look like cancer. This is a patient I need to send to Jeff for imaging. This is a patient that might need a biopsy. Right? Whereas the other guy could say, eh, elevated PSA, but it all looks like normal sugars on it. We can ignore that. Um, so that's the, we need enabling technology to do about that, but that's where we're going. Another thing we found, which is really interesting, is there's a different type of sweetness in cancer. These little diamonds on the end connote what's called sialic acid. It's a type of sugar that really goes up in cancer for reasons I don't quite understand. Um, the reason sialic acid is interesting is this. Sialic acid, this little figure here, show, it binds to a receptor like a key in a lock on, a, on immune cells and turns them off. So this sugar can turn off immune cells. It's remarkable. Um, this is analogous to the work Jim Allison did a, a, that won the Nobel Prize a couple years ago. This is immunotherapy. So what Jim Allison discovered is that there's cancer cells, devious things they are, make PDL1, which is a protein that also turns off immune cells. If you interfere with that, suddenly the immune, immune system can recognize cancer again. Glycoproteins, sialic acids, doing the exact same thing. So we're running very fast. We have data in our laboratory that this is operative in prostate cancer, and we're running trying to see if we can get it to the point where it's uh, translated into the clinic as a new therapy. Um, so I gave you examples of you know, how we take tumors and analyze them in the laboratory, then try and bring it back. So bedside to bench, bench to bedside. Happy to discuss with you any other example. We have several other examples where we've done this. 
in other tumor types and in prostate cancer. And I want to thank you.